The week after, the week before, protests in Israel have remained fierce following the Benjamin Netanyahu-led coalition's passing of the controversial reasonableness bill, a bill that limits the High Court's powers to overturn government decisions deemed unreasonable. This bill is being passed to the High Court, which is now stuck between a rock of enacting this law and severely reducing its powers, and a hard place of overruling it and risking a constitutional crisis. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, in the midst of a foreign media blitz, has not only played down the significance of the reforms, but has remained coy on whether he would accept the High Court if they overrule the legislation. However, Defence Minister Yoav Gallant has said that he will abide by the law of the country. Elsewhere, several prominent legislators from Netanyahu's own Likud party have publicly stated their opposition to pushing forward with more of the judicial reforms without a public consensus. Is there a revolt brewing in the Likud party? And what could this mean for Netanyahu? Opposition leader Yair Lapid has said he will only engage in talks if the reforms are halted until 2025. Should Lapid swallow his pride and try and salvage some form of compromise, or is he right to stand firm? What's next for Israel's judicial reforms? All right, so let's get to it. What is next for Israel's uh, judicial uh, reforms? Uh, ladies, gentlemen, uh, as always, we begin with our quick fire round, 30 seconds each to lay out your initial stance on the matter, and we'll pick up the conversation uh, from there. So, uh, Nitsana Dershan Leitner, please take the lead. Your 30 seconds are on. So, the opponents of the reform have filed a petition to the High Court of Justice to annul this basic law, which cancelled the unreasonable clause. Uh, and the Supreme Court has never annulled a basic law, but this does not mean anything. If the Supreme Court annuls the law, there will be a constitutional crisis and there will be a disaster. Um, in addition, the reform will continue. The government currently wants to uh, continue with it, to um, change the way the uh, judges are appointed in Israel. Um, and uh, again, this will be will cause another storm yeah. with the open end to the reform and the one who are in favor. Alison kaplan Sommer, your your thoughts? Um, this so-called rebellion within the Likud looks a little bit staged to me. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu has not been 100% with the hardliners in his party. Uh, you saw the pictures of him sitting in the middle of Gallant and Yariv Levine and then sort of playing a tug of war above him. And I think that he is giving a nod of the head to the Yuli Edelsteins and the other members of the Likud party who are quote unquote rebelling against uh, pushing the reforms through full steam once the Knesset comes back in the for in the fall. And I think uh, Netanyahu is behind this rebellion, keeping his options open. Yeah, so not out of control, but very much in control. We will get uh, further into the uh, uh, Likud party uh, situation later on in the show. Last but not least, Dr. Shani Moore, your take. I'd be very skeptical if the Supreme Court intervenes on the reasonableness law regarding the rest of the reform package. I don't think it's the package itself that's terribly important, but how it fits into all the other external pressures. The government's dealing with very bad poll numbers, a possible diplomatic opening, a possible security situation on at least one of Israel's borders, um, and the continuing trial of the prime minister. All those will determine this much more than any real principle at stake with the reforms themselves. All right, uh, from this point onwards, let's uh, feel free uh, to interact, to engage in a conversation. And let's begin uh, from uh, this uh, potential pending constitutional uh, constitutional crisis uh, uh, Nitsana was uh, alluding uh, to. Uh, it was only short days ago when Netanyahu was asked by Wolf Blitzer whether um, what will happen should the Supreme Court intervene. He tried to dodge this bullet, but this morning, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant answering the same question well, Israel is a democratic state, it will obey uh, the law. So far, the Supreme Court saying no, uh, no injunction until we convene to discuss it in September. So even if, if for the time being it is halted, is Israel nearing a, a constitutional crisis, um, uh, Allison? Uh, the constitutional crisis, should it come, is going to come after the uh, Knesset tries to pass the first law that the uh, that the um, courts will can, can call unreasonable, and whether or not that the uh, the government accepts that ruling, it can state in principle. Netanyahu can state in principle that he will accept or not accept the uh, the court's ruling. That's actually not going to trigger a crisis. That's going to be a crisis in theory. What's going to be a crisis in action 
is uh, when the uh, when the courts decide to uh, to uphold unreasonableness, uh, whether it because stays the law of the land, and uh, whether or not the government accepts that kind of decision, and whether the civil service and whether the security forces have to choose as to whether they're going to obey the government, obey the prime minister, or obey the ruling of the courts. That is when a real constitution, constitutional crisis will happen. Nitana, please. Look, um, for the court to get involved in this sensitive issue uh, will be a game changer. In the end of the day, you're talking about authority that the court grabbed without being authorized, not by law, not by anybody, not by Knesset. Uh, just simply because the Aaron Barak, the Chief Justice, 30 years ago decided that he's doing a constitutional revolution and he's taking um, a position that everything is justiciable and he will cancel anything that he doesn't like fit. It goes by laws. If he finds a law that is not um, in favor, he's not in favor of, he can cancel it or any act of the government. If it doesn't fit uh, reasonable, he will cancel it. The Knesset came now and said no more. They want to restore what happened, what was used to be 30 years ago. For the Supreme Court to get involved in this specific law, it will be a disaster. It will be a disaster for two reasons. One, because there is really not much to get involved in okay. this basic law. In the end of the day, the, uh, the uh, unreasonable cause was not canceled. It was minimized. Uh, it was just uh, limited so, to the acts of the government, yeah. to the acts of ministers. Let them carry out their policy, not to let the court to be the supreme so, ruler of yeah. the country. And therefore, the court should not get involved. If so, he yeah. does get involved, then there will be an issue who the authority will obey to. The so, court. So, yeah. To the so, so, so Dr. Moore, is the court right or wrong uh, to stay out of it? Well, I don't think it's made a decision yet, but I, I want to actually just map out conceptually the things we're talking about Please. because um, I think it's important. An, an, a, a, narrowly, a narrowly defined constitutional crisis is, as Allison was saying, uh, when you have different centers of authority and the actual people executing uh, uh, authorized decisions um, don't know who to obey. Um, the court in every country in the world has uh, the authority to tell governments that it's violating the law, that is, executive branches. Um, there's different standards for how that is achieved, and, and this new legislation changes that. Uh, in most countries, courts also have the authority to tell parliaments that legislation itself is unconstitutional if it violates some higher level statute, like a basic law. Um, that's also not uh, been the, that's been the case in Israel for at least 30 years, as uh, Nitzan was alluding to. There is an additional level of judicial mm -hmm. review here, which is implied, which has never happened in Israel and almost never happened anywhere in the world, which is for a court to say that a basic law itself violates a larger foundational ideal. Yeah. Uh, I ideal. Um, in Israel, that has never happened. The court's power to uh, uh, overturn legislation mostly derives from its apparent contradiction uh, with the basic law. But in the decision that it made not to intervene on the basic, on the nation state basic law, the court left for itself the opening in future Mm. Um, to decide that basic legislation could be in violation of Israel's foundational precepts as a Jewish and democratic state. And the reason why this is even necessary is because the procedure for passing a basic law or amending a basic law is essentially just like ordinary legislation, unlike in other countries where a constitutional amendment is very complicated. That's never happened. Were that to happen, we could find ourselves in exactly the kind of constitutional crisis that Allison was alluding to. But as Nitan was suggesting a, a moment ago, this particular bit of legislation would be a really odd way one for that crisis to happen on. Uh, the legislation that was passed is obviously deeply unpopular with the legal establishment. It's opposed by um, a great deal of very sensible people um, uh, for, for lots of very good reasons. Yeah. But it seems a very, very tiny thing to want to test out the possibility of the court being able to, again, not tell yeah. the government that it's what it's doing is illegal, not tell the parliament that what it's doing is unconstitutional, but to tell essentially the constituent body, which is also the parliament in Israel, that its own basic law is somehow also unconstitutional. That uh, seems to me, and I could be wrong in the end, it seems to me extremely unlikely. Yeah. Where that could happen is if the uh, reform 
continues apace and uh, a more drastic reform is passed through right. also as a form of basic law or basic law amendment, then I could see a situation where the court might feel it has no choice right. uh, but to intervene even on something that is a basic law. Were we in a situation where the court did such a thing and the government said, we're not planning on obeying that, uh, and by the way, I don't it. think that what Galen said today, by the way, was so unequivocal. Mm. I don't think it was as reassuring as it was portrayed in the opening report. Um, uh, he left himself a lot of room there, uh, uh, too. W were we to find ourselves in that situation, that could be a veritable constitutional crisis. Right now, I don't think that's yeah. where we're headed. So the reasonableness uh, uh, law, not, this is not the do or die uh, uh, battlefront. Uh, um, uh, so, so let's talk about what is to happen from this point onwards. And despite the fears of you know demoralization or despair, we have seen mass protests remaining quite mass, uh, but what is the current objective of the protests, um, uh, Alison? They're vowing uh, to move from defense to offense. What rabbits can they pull out of their sleeves? Um, well, they claim that they have a toolbox and they haven't used all of the tools. Uh, I'm a little skeptical about that, um, considering that they've, uh, you know, already uh, barricaded the airports. They've gone to the train station, so uh, so we'll see what they have. But the pressure has to remain on. This reasonableness law is basically the first slice in the salami. The uh, yeah. coalition has made. No secret of that, the previous discussion about the courts, which is why it may be holding back its firepower for the, the, the further steps in the overhaul, which would involve changing the Judicial Selection Committee or even an override clause, meaning that the Knesset could override decisions mm. of the Supreme Court. And, the, um, and they're going to keep the pressure on. The protests need to keep the pressure on so that the Likud yeah. doesn't feel that it can forge ahead with no consequences. Okay. And Nitana, briefly before we take a break, and uh, let's leave some time for Dr. Moore to conclude. Yeah, Nitana, please. There isn't. The, the protests will not end until this government will fall. Mm. Way long we know that these protesters are not protesting against any close of the reform. It's just a trigger, it's just a reason to bring the government down. And anything this government will do, whether pass a reform, pass a legislation, the draft law, any of the kind of the law that they intend to bring down, the protesters will continue and continue because they cannot bear the fact that Netanyahu and the Likud are governing in Israel. Okay, uh, Dr. Moore, we will all uh, stay on our toes uh, to listen uh, what, to what you have to say uh, right after uh, the break. We do need to take a very short break now, but when we get back, we continue to unpack the current and future uh, state of the state uh, of, uh, of Israel. Uh, dear panelists, you're staying with us, and uh, dear viewers, so should you. A few minutes, and we're back. Welcome back to the summit. Uh, still with us, Dr. Shani Moore, Alison Kaplan Sommer, and Nitsana Dorshan Leitner. Thank you all very much uh, for staying with us. We're also staying on topic, of course, but before we get back to our conversation, um, we're starting to hear some uh, Likud party uh, members. Uh, Netanyahu's, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's only Likud party voicing uh, dismay of the of the uh, of pursuing more judicial uh, overhaul uh, uh, legislation. Is the party um, on the verge of collapse, or is it just so, you know, background noise. Let's take a listen to uh, what Julie Edelstein had to say this weekend. I own up to my mistakes. I may have been asleep at the wheel as far as what happens now. I have no fundamental issue with the reasonableness bill that I voted for and supported, but we have to learn from this. And now I tell you unequivocally, I saw that every time there was an offer to find a compromise, someone vetoed it or threatened to leave the coalition, that is over. From now on, they will have to coordinate with me the content, the timing, the, the choice of words of every bill. They will have to be coordinated with me, as I said, on everything. All right, let's get to it. Another quick fire round, 30 seconds each without your initial take and we'll pick up pick up the conversation from there is there an inner Likud rebellion in the making Dr. Shani Moore please take the lead your 30 seconds are on I have no way of knowing if there's an inner Likud rebellion <laughs> I don't have any inside information and it's far beyond my capacity to speculate I know that there's been a massive um, shift in the polling data something that hasn't happened in Israel in at least 15 years I don't anticipate that that will change between now and the next election in any material way and a party that is on the verge of losing an election whether it's now or in three years behaves like a party that's on the verge of losing an election yeah fair enough Nitzana Doshan Leitner your thoughts well, uh, there is a beginning of revolt in the Likud, but it's not actually beginning because we saw it in the 
previously around. Uh, on the opposition side to uh, uh, Minister of Justice, uh, Yari Levine, we find you the Els, Yuli Edelstein, mm -hmm. Danny Danon, Joachim Galland, um, David Bittan. Uh, there are four. And uh, remember that we need uh, more than 60 to pass the reform. So if from the 64 of the coalition, there will be four or less, there will be uh, a problem passing the reform. And this yeah. is their strength to continue the revolt. Last but not least, Elson kaplan Sommer, your, your take? As I mentioned, I think that this is possibly a staged rebellion orchestrated right. by Benjamin Netanyahu, who is keeping an eye on the polls, sees that the party is, uh, isn't is doing well, sees that it's being identified with uh, the hardline camp of Yariv Levine and other very extreme, often offensive members of the Likud party. And that's why it's becoming unpopular with the public. It's losing its moderate wing. And, uh, and therefore, I think that it is possibly a staged rebellion and not a real uh, a real rebellion that it's a uh, behind the scenes effort by Benjamin Netanyahu to uh, to regain the more moderate ground. All right, uh, and I remind you, dear panelists, that uh, you're more than welcome uh, to engage in a conversation, uh, to to interact. Um, so let's uh, move to the other side of the political spectrum, the opposition benches. Should Yair Lapid, um, to an extent, uh, you know, swallow his his pride, Yair Lapid, Benny Gantz, for that matter, and, and try to salvage uh, 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 the situation and form a unity government with Benjamin Netanyahu, Allison? Well, Yair Lapid is famously with his finger to the wind and trying to figure out, you know, what is the position that's going to get him the most political support. He lost a lot of uh, political support during the judicial reform debate because Benny Gantz, who's his rival in this camp, mm. was perceived as being more reasonable and willing to negotiate than he was, and he was less willing to negotiate and more hard line identifying with the, uh, the stronger leaders of the protest movement in refusing to sit down and negotiate with uh, with Netanyahu. He saw how that affected his popularity and his uh, and his poll numbers, and so he has been pivoting back into being more willing to uh, to negotiate uh, to see that if he can uh, he can reposition himself as being um, uh, more in favor of compromise. But I think now that this reasonableness law has been unilaterally pushed through, I think that it's going to be very very difficult for anyone on the other side to sit down and negotiate with this Netanyahu government. Now that they've shown that uh, that they're not really interested in negotiation and compromise, that they're interested in uh, in meeting their own goals. You know, before we circle back to politics, uh, Dr. Shani Moore, I do want to um, uh, pick up on, uh, on a term uh, Allison used and is frequently used in, in recent weeks, unilaterally passed legislation in a parliamentary system. Is that um, uh, is that even possible, unilateral legislation? Well, again, this wasn't legislation. This was um, the Knesset acting in its constituent authority, um, making basic legislation. Um, and that's a rather unusual thing to be doing on such a narrow majority, mm. um, only coalition and opposition. I would take us back, though, um, about a year ago to something that I think was even um, uh, more notable in the annals of Israeli democracy. The current governing coalition uh, essentially forced an election early when it was in the opposition by uh, refusing to vote for a basic um, procedural vote um, regarding uh, the uh, civil status of the settlers in the West Bank, something that was in their own constituents' interests, mm -hmm. uh, because the threat was, unless you hand us over power, you may have a majority that you want in a democratic election, but unless you hand us over power, we will sabotage the workings of government in a way that will create such chaos right. that you'll, you'll find the country ungovernable. Now, politics is rough. Um, in any democratic country, and it's rough in Israel too. But uh, until 2022, nobody had ever done something like that. Nobody had ever said, I'm going to vote against something I'm in favor of, where the consequences will be a legal and political chaos and ungovernability of the country, for all the reasons it's, we don't have the time to, to get into it now, yeah. um, only because that I'm, I'm essentially holding you hostage. Nobody did that. You cannot imagine, for example, the current opposition saying, we're going to vote against a normalization deal with Saudi Arabia, even if that ends up plunging Israel into a pointless war somewhere mm. um, because we want this government to resign. Um, but uh, that having been said, there's absolutely no reason for uh, uh, Mr. Lapid or Gantz um, to be the suckers uh, of, uh, of this coalition which uh, swept itself into power on such an uh, unprecedentedly unethical uh, parliamentary maneuver. If this government needs support from the outside for a normalization deal or for some other uh, diplomatic development or some other emergency that could come up, and they, and they often do, that's fine. 
Um, but there's absolutely no reason for them uh, to save this prime minister's skin. Um, this is a prime minister who is under indictment. This is a prime minister who has, uh, in six months, caused untold damage to uh, the people's army, to Israel's economy, and to Israel's international standing. If he needs a lifeline, it can be from his coalition. And if he's found himself trapped by the contradictions of his own policies, uh, that's, that's his problem at this point. Nitana Dorshan Leidner, um, how do you uh, see the current uh, political um, wiggle room of, for Netanyahu, from Netanyahu's standpoint, that is? Look, uh, we find ourselves in a very uh, unprecedented uh, situation where there is an elected government in Israel that cannot carry out its policy because of um, masses of people opposing the government that hold it hostage by refusing to, um, by, by uh, disobedience, not only civil but disobedience on the streets, demonstrations and such, which is a democratic state, is a very welcome step. But uh, military disobedience, people announce that are not going to uh, serve in reserve anymore. Uh, economic uh, disobedience, people um, encourage uh, high tech companies to pull their money out of Israel, uh, going even and putting pressure, international pressure on Israel for um, a, mm. stopping this uh, reform. Um, and uh, Netanyahu is standing among all of this, uh, standing the pressure. He knows where the country is going, but he has this faith that he owes his policy to his election to, and therefore he cannot just tell them, I'm not going to do it despite all the uh, all these uh, protesters. And the protesters know that Netanyahu is in their pocket, that any time he wants to do something, they will light the country in fire. They don't care to join themselves with the country, just not to let Netanyahu and his government to carry out this policy. It's an impossible situation for any elected government. Hey, I see you liked it. One more? Just hit the subscribe button right here. Go on. I know you want to.